use of, misuse of institutions. Richard, last I'm word to you. Um, I'm working through all of it now. A couple of slides. Yeah. Um, disability records, we know something about the lives of people with disabilities in this period. She was a woman who lived in Cambridgeshire and she was asked questions, a bit like the questions I talked about earlier. Uh, when she was asked, uh, was she able to say, she said, yes, I'm in Ely. However, she couldn't name the days of the week, her son or two of her three husbands, and she, she claimed to have, and she did not know how many shillings were in 40 pence. Uh, as she was also thought to have the face and countenance of an idiot, the officials decided she had insufficient intelligence or memory to manage herself, and her lands or her goods were all taken away from her because she was a wealthy woman. So this has been going on a long, long time. Next one. In the 19th century, things came to an end. By 1850, every county, bottom side there, had to have a county asylum where people were locked away. Then, people who couldn't manage, because either they couldn't get a work or didn't want to work, were put into workhouses from 1834. Before that, people had been given support at home. But in light of what had happened after the Napoleonic Wars, the government got very tough. It was a Tory government like we've got today. <laughs> and they decided that it had to be really tough in these workhouses. And by 1850, it wasn't the shirkers. It was actually disabled people. More than 50% of the people in the workhouses were disabled people. And yet the regime had been made so horrible to actually force people to work, but people who couldn't work were there and stuck there because there was no other means of getting life support. This idea then went forward and we got the long-stay institutions and I said a bit about how that happened. We'll say a bit more about that next one. A very important person, disabled himself in some ways, he had depression throughout his life, and, uh, but when he was Home Secretary in 1913, after the agitation of these people who wanted the Mental Deficiency Act, I talked about that earlier. Uh, he, there was a bill in Parliament, which was finally there in 1913, and this is part of the speech he made. The unnatural and increasingly rapid growth of the feeble-minded classes, coupled with a steady restriction on all the thrifty, energetic and superior stocks, <coughs> constitutes a race danger. That's to the British race, I think. I feel that the source from which this mad, stream of madness is fed should be cut off and sealed up before another year has passed. Interestingly, in this institution we're sitting in, in that debate, only two MPs <coughs> voted against this legislation. Only two out of the whole Parliament. And the Mental Deficiency Act went through. It wasn't repealed until 1959, but the effects of it lasted into the 90s and even into the noughties. So, up to 130,000 people were licensed, some in private institutions, some in guardianship but at least 60,000 put into the hospitals that we've been talking about. And that's 60,000 at any one time. So it went on for a long time. Next. And uh, click one more, I think we've seen one there. So people first, national self-advocates, uh, have been people who've been seeking to become voices for their own rights. And we've been supporting them. We've already heard from Paddy, but there is a network of these organisations across the whole country. We need to support them more. Their voice isn't heard enough. And I think that's very important. One of their slogans was label jars, not people. And I think that was a very strong slogan. Let's go on. And they've been doing their own research, partly through the OU project and people like Jan, into their, their history. But this is the one back. There is this the reality we face. The faces may have changed, but the methods are the same. You see there Mr. Cameron with a great big hammer, Vatos, hammering the bona fide claimants. And who is uh, opposing this? Disabled people against the cuts. Now, next. Uh, what we're faced with here is we managed to get a convention which included people with learning difficulties, people with learning disabilities, were there in New York in 2006. I was there representing the British Disabled People Movement. And we managed to get a convention of human rights for the whole world about disabled people. And it shifted us from seeing the problem in the person to seeing the problem out there beyond the person. It's what people's attitudes are. It's that they don't think what's needed so people can actually live their life, change the environment, change the methods, change the forms of communication. That is all now in an international human rights treaty that this government, believe it or not, is signed up to. Uh, it signed up in 2009 and has not come out of it. Now 167 countries are supporting it. Next. But 
Only two weeks ago, that same body, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, 17 out of 18 of them are disabled people themselves, which in itself is unique, uh, did an investigation into the UK and what they've been doing over the last five or six years, and they came out and said this is a grave and systematic violation of our human rights. What they've done is portrayed us negatively in the media, uh, they've made us dependent on benefits, committing, claimed we were committing frauds, disproportionately applied taking support allowance off us, uh, bedroom tax, which didn't exempt disabled people. There have been a couple of cases in the High Court of one, but the majority of disabled people are being hit by the bedroom tax. Even though they need someone living support and so on, it doesn't matter, they're still hit. Uh, and did not take into account the support needed for a complex nature of their impairments and had no visible increase. Uh, impact in decreasing unemployment. So it didn't, all of these measures haven't worked. And as you can see there on the right, there was a, a big article last week about how women have been hit, and they have been hit harder by the cuts, but actually disabled people have been hit much harder than anybody else. Uh, and that is continuing. With a thir The 30 billion has come out of the disabled people's budgets, so there's another 20 million to come out. Maybe tomorrow, some more, when we have the autumn statement. So this is a live issue and what we try and do with disability history is link the past and the battles that have been fought of people in fighting wherever they are, like resisting, scrubbing the floor with a toothbrush. Most of it is not recorded, no one will ever know, but sometimes it comes through. Last I'll end on, in uh, 1275, there was a colony of lepers in Nor Norfolk who were not treated properly by the abbot and the church, so they actually had a riot. Now who knows about that riot? But people have been resisting all the way through, and we must build that resistance now, and we must ask all non-disabled people to be our allies in that struggle, so we finally get the equality that we should have under human rights treatment. So that's why we're so pleased to be involved with this project, because we feel that this information is really useful for educating all young people to understand what equality really means. Thank you.